Hello and welcome. I know that many of you guys like my videos about repairs and restoration, but don't you also think that today is a nice day for an interesting DIY? At least I think so. And in the end of today's video I hope that you feel the same. I have here one interesting mainboard, it is made by ASUS and the name is PI P55TP4XEG, revision 2.4. This was a quite common mainboard back in the days as Pentium was a new and shiny CPU on the market. It is based on the Intel 430FX chipset, also known as Triton 1. Although this chipset was quite solid for its time, it is actually quite slow as well. It was made in the time before Pentium MMX was released and so it officially supports only non-MMX Pentium 1 CPUs with frontside bus of 50 60 and 66 MHz and a core speed of up to 200 MHz. The pre-MMX CPUs needed single CPU voltage of 3.3V, which was not provided by the AT power supply, so the big cooler with a voltage regulator is located down here on the mainboard. Up here we have the level 2 cache. Currently there are 256 KB of total cache installed. But this mainboard supports up to 512 kilobytes of level 2 cache. The cache can be extended either using the DIP ICs or so-called COAST module. Unfortunately, both types of cache cannot be used simultaneously. And here on the left we have four PCI slots and three ISO slots. As this board was sold, the AGP port was not yet introduced, so this main board is limited to PCI graphics cards only. Well, ISA too, but that makes no sense. So, why do you think did this main board actually caught my attention? As you probably see, the lowest PCI slot has some kind of proprietary extension. It is called ASUS Media Bus. There were different versions of these slot extensions and they all were incompatible to each other. ASUS messed it completely up and today a mainboard and such a media bus expansion card, which would fit to each other, are quite hard to find. Apparently I have here a card which does fit into this mainboard. It is a combination of an Adaptex SCSI controller, which hangs on the main PCI interface and a second part, a Creative Sound Blaster Vibra 16. I think that I don't need to explain what a Sound Blaster 16 is, but the interesting thing is that despite of the compactness of the card, it still has the original Yamaha OPL3 chip, which would give a nice and genuine FM sound in the DOS games. And furthermore, it even kept the wavetable header for Dota board and general MIDI sound. Uh, on top we have here ultra wide SCSI and 50p normal SCSI connectors for the hard drive, CD-ROMs, etc. And on the slot brackets we have the usual sound card stuff. Joystick port, audio in and output and the volume control wheel. This SCSI and sound expansion card can be plugged into this slot like that. And I thought, where I have such a rare combination at hand, it would be quite cool to make a retro PC based around it. But it would be quite boring just to take it and simply push the whole thing into a case, so I wondered if I can make some interesting upgrades to this board. Let's start simple. This board has a Dallas RTC module, which I modified a long time ago by adding an external CR2032 battery. I already showed a couple of times how this can be done. It works just fine, but there is one slight problem with this mode. The RTC module is located in the end of the ISO slot and with the battery on top it is simply too high. When I am trying to plug in a longer ISO card into the slot, the modified RTC module with the battery is in the way. So the last ISO slot is unusable for a longer cards like this one and that is a shame. What can be done about it? Well, I could put the CR2032 on wires and remove it from the top of the RTC module, but fortunately I have this. If you watch my channel regularly, you will remember this RTC module replacement, which I introduced some time ago. 
We can now simply replace the original RTC module by this NW3287 and it should be low enough so using long ISO cards would be possible again. And as you see it is a perfect fit. Ok, the new RTC module is installed. Let's take a look what else can be improved. In this board a Pentium 133 is currently installed. A 3.3 volt CPU which is powered by this voltage regulator. Unlike ATX, the AT power supply doesn't provide 3.3 volts, but only plus minus 5 and 12 volts. So the voltage conversion down to 3.3 volts need to be made directly on the mainboard. And as you see this regulator has a big heatsink, because it can get quite hot. It is completely responsible for the CPU power, which is actually quite hungry. As I said, this is a Pentium 133 MHz CPU, which you can see here. The CPU is a good fit for this mainboard, which supports Pentium CPUs from 75 MHz to 200 MHz. But wouldn't it be nice to have a Pentium MMX 200 MHz in this mainboard? Beside the MMX instructions, which can boost the performance in some optimized applications, this CPU has also twice as large level 1 cache as the normal non-MMX Pentium, 32KB instead of 16. The MMX variant of the Pentium CPU had some more improvements and depending on application it could provide very measurable performance gain over the non-MMX version on the same core frequency. So let's see why we can't just drop in a Pentium MMX into the socket. This mainboard was made in the time where Pentium MMX was not yet released, so officially it doesn't support the CPU. The actual problem is neither the MMX nor too old chipset on this mainboard, but the CPU voltage. You see, original non-MMX Pentium CPUs used so-called 3.3V single voltage power. To get down with the temperature, Intel decided to lower the CPU voltage for the Pentium MMX CPUs. However, all the infrastructure around the CPU was already implemented for 3.3 volts and switching everything to a lower voltage would mean a huge amount of re-engineering and electric incompatibility to all the devices already available on the market. So Intel introduced an interesting solution which lives on until today. A dual voltage, one voltage for the I.O. at 3.3 volt which was used for communication with the infrastructure and one core voltage, which the CPU used internally. For the Pentium MMX200, the core voltage, which is also called V-Core, was set at 2.8 volts, and the peripheral I.O. voltage, or V.I.O., remained at 3.3 volts, just as for all the Pentiums before. Now to the problem with this mainboard. The bad news is that it was made for 3.3V single voltage CPUs and will not work with uh, dual voltage CPUs out of the box. The good news is, however, it was prepared for a VRM, a voltage regulator module, which can be added to provide additional CPU voltages. As you see, the VRM connector is not yet soldered. It has two rows of 15 pins each and some of them are hardwired. The question is, what is the pinout? Well, luckily Intel described the VRM in its Pentium processor flexible motherboard design guidelines. It receives multiple voltages, 3.3 volts, 5 volts and 12 volts. So if the CPU is a single voltage model, like all the non-MMX Pentiums, then the pins A4 through A7 and B4 through B7 can be simply shorted. This is what we see here on this mainboard. Here the same 3.3 volts are directly sent to the VIO and the V-Core. In case of dual voltage CPUs like Pentium MMX, the 3.3 volt should be sent only to the VIO and the V-Core should be regulated from the 5 volt rail. Theoretically, it is also possible to get it from the 12 volts rail, but this might be too much of a current, since we have only one 12 volts pin. 
Furthermore, dependent on the type of regulator, it could probably be more efficient to get low voltage from 5 volts than from 12 volts. And apropos voltage, current and efficiency, the Pentium MMX CPU, which I'd like to use in this mainboard, needs 2.8 plus minus 0.1 volts. And due to Intel's documentation, this CPU draws up to 5.7 amps. That's quite a lot, actually, and using a linear voltage regulator, as I showed it for a 486 in one of my last videos, would need a big heat spreader to dissipate over 12 watts. I think we need a more efficient solution. And to remind you a little bit, a linear voltage regulator provides a steady output voltage from a higher input voltage, dissipating excessive energy as heat. And that heat can be reduced using another type of a voltage regulator. Let's imagine to have a power switch between the power supply unit which delivers 5 volts and the CPU. If the switch gets flipped, the CPU will be powered directly by the PSU. Following graph visualize how the voltage on the CPU would look like in this case. The blue line represents the voltage over the time and due to physical restrictions the voltage will not instantly rise to 5 volts when the switch gets flipped but will take such a slope nearing 5 volts after a while. Please keep in mind that this whole visualization is very inaccurate, simplified and exaggerated. It serves only for explanational purpose and is not a precise model. Anyway, this voltage would be just fine if the CPU would need 5 volts, but what if it needs for example 3 volts? Let's install a voltmeter between the switch and the CPU and turn on the switch again. But now, instead of just waiting until the voltage gets up to 5 volts, we will turn off the switch again when the voltage on the voltmeter reaches 3 volts. Certainly, the voltage will drop to zero after a short period of time again, so it doesn't sound too exciting so far. However, what if we repeat the game and turn the switch on again, when the voltage reaches, let's say, 2.9 volts? Now the voltage will rise until we switch off at 3 volts again. And so on, and so on. If we keep switching on and off all the time, we will be able to keep the voltage between 2.9 and 3 volts, and so convert 5 volts to nearly 3 volts as required. This is the theory so far, but in reality such switching must happen very often, from hundreds to millions times a second. Neither a human hand nor any mechanical switch would stand such a stress. So, in reality, something like this will be used. Again, this is a very simplified representation, which should just explain the idea. Instead of a mechanical switch, a transistor is used, which will be turned on or off by a so-called pulse with modulation controller, or short PWM. Instead of the voltmeter, there is so-called feedback connection, which is used by the PWM controller to measure the voltage on the CPU and to decide if it's time to switch the transistor on or off. The principle behind this circuit is the same as I explained before with a switch. And it is called switching power regulator. Such a solution is extremely widely used. You will find it on mainboards, graphics cards, in every notebook and even in the USB power supply which you use daily to charge your phone. It is very useful to know and understand how it works, because it is the number one reason for failing of all the devices I just said. But why did it become so useful? Where is the benefit to a linear voltage regulator, which I presented in another video? Well, the transistor heats up when it is turned on and cools down again when it is off. So instead of keeping it on all the time, like it is done with the linear voltage regulator, which has to dissipate a lot of heat, the switching voltage regulator gets always some time to cool down a little bit between the cycles. It still gets quite warm, but it is by far more efficient than a usual linear voltage regulator and so needs a lot smaller cooling solutions. However, switching voltage regulators do also have an important drawback. They generate not a steady voltage like linear voltage regulators do, 
but such a jigsaw pattern. To work around this effect a little bit, usually a big capacitor is added to the circuit, which acts as a low-pass filter and flattens the jigsaw character of the output. Again, this is very inaccurate representation, and in the reality, it is usually not as perfect as the pink line shown here, but you hopefully get the idea. In reality, this line is still not as stable as it sometimes needs to be, that's why switching voltage regulators are rarely used in the high-end audio equipment. Furthermore, I was talking only about the voltage so far, but flipping a switch also produces high current peaks, which are usually filtered by an additional inductor. So if you need a hint, if a voltage regulator in front of you is a linear or a switching one, then search for a big inductor nearby. If you see one, that's probably a switching regulator. A linear regulator, on the other hand, would probably have a bigger heat spreader instead. Also, the 3 volt output is just an example, since the PWM controller can be certainly configured for different output voltages, like 2.8 volts, which we need for the Pentium MMX. So far the theory, and with all that information I designed a PCB which should fit into this VRM connector like that. So let's build and test it. Since the Pentium MMX draws almost 6 amps of current, I found it complicated to find inexpensive parts which would stand that load. So I decided to use a pair of DC-DC converters each designed for up to 3 amps, and since the CPU draws maximum 5.7 amps, we should be well below the limits. This decision cuts the cost at least in half, probably even more. For the connector I have the simple 2x15 female header here, but I will not solder it now. Instead I'll solder two wires for a basic test first, where I can connect a power supply and see if the regulator does what it should at all. So let's use a workbench power supply for the initial test. I'll set the input voltage at 5 volts and limit the current to 500 milliamps. Let's connect. Ok, nothing exploded, and the parts remain stone cold. The voltage on the power supply remains at 5 volts, and the current is only at 38 milliamps. That means that we have no short so far, that is a good sign. Let's test the voltage. Ok, 4.8 volts. That is totally wrong. I was expecting something around 3 volts. I made some jumpers up here to set other voltages. Let's switch it uh, a bit and see if something changes. <laughs> 
Okay, still 4.8 volts. And again 4.8 volts. Unfortunately, the switches don't change anything. At least, the ICs remain cold, and there is something on the output. That's already a step forward. And I would like to quote a good friend of mine. If something works on the first try, you probably overlook something very important. So I'm kind of glad that it doesn't work yet. So, I found the issue. And the culprit was just as so often sitting on the chair. Unfortunately, I ordered the wrong DC-DC converters. I installed those XL2596S-12E1, which is a converter for 12 volt outputs, but I needed these XL2596S-ADJ-E1, where ADJ stands for adjustable, since I want to adjust the output using the switches, and as you see, I reordered the right parts and uh, prepared the VRM module for replacement. Now let's install the right ICs. Ok, the adjustable converters are now in place. Let's uh, give it a second try. The power supply is again connected and we seem not to have any shorts. The module is now set to 3 volts. Let's see if we get something around that on the output. Ok, that looks much better. We now have 3.1 volts. That is a bit too high, but since there is currently no load, maybe it is slightly off. Let's set it to 2.9 volts. And here we have 2.9 volts indeed. Let's continue with 2.8 volts. And it is on point. What's next? 2.6 volts. And we are at 2.6. Well, almost 2.7 actually. Now 2.5 volts. Yeah, almost 2.5 volts as well. 2.4. Looks also quite good. And 2.3 volts. is okay-ish. And last but not least, 2.2 volts. Well, it's almost at 2.3 volts, but still doesn't look too bad. Well, those values can vary a little bit as soon as the module is in the main board and is under load. But I think they are close enough for a prototype, and they are not too easy to get exactly. I made such a table with formula for the resistors and voltages to calculate the right values which are currently installed on the module. I guess these values can be adjusted in the future if needed. For now, I consider the voltages close enough so we can move on with the tests. Now the leads for the workbench power supply can be removed again and the connector can be finally soldered to the module. 
back to the main board. As I said, it has no header to connect the voltage regulator module, so I will simply use two rows of such pin headers and solder them into the main board. The board has big copper ground and power planes in the area around the VRM, so I'm heating up the board with a hot air in one hand and use desoldering station in the other to get the solder out of the holes. I'll insert the pins directly into the module, so I easily can cut the length and align the connector. Pay attention that there is no key, so the direction is important. Pin 1 on the VRM is ground, just like in the documentation by Intel. Plugging the module wrong way around could damage the module, the CPU and the mainboard, so it is very important to double check the orientation and the alignment. And here it is, ready for the next test. I would like not to burn the CPU now, so I'll add a wire into the CPU socket on the VCC pin. Let's see uh, what we get. The main board is on, nothing exploded so far. And we have the required 2.8 volts on the VCC pin. That gives some hope. And I think it's time to get brave and insert the CPU for the real test. I'll also add a PC speaker to be able to hear some post beeps, if there will be any. The Pentium CPUs didn't get too hot very fast and could even work a couple of minutes without a cooler completely. I'll keep my thumb on the CPU to feel if it gets hot too fast, so maybe I will be able to turn it off quickly. Fingers crossed. And I'm very sorry for being so evil, but this video already became quite long and I'm tired, so I thought why not making a cut here. I hope I could wake up your interest just a little bit. If you are curious to see if the CPU survived this treatment and if the module could handle the load, please tune into the second part of this video. And if you like this one, believe me, you will love the next one as well. Don't forget to subscribe and leave your feedback below. And so far, thank you and goodbye.